They will be performing Thursday night, May 8th, outside the Arts Council on the sidewalk on the steps of the Arts Center, so at 5.30. So they didn't ask me to do that, but I'd like for you to know that. So. Okay. Next on our agenda is another recognition of some outstanding students. We have
adoption of, the, of our agenda. Madam Chairman, I'd like to make a motion that we amend the uh, agenda this evening. I'd like to uh, go into executive session or closed session for personnel issues uh, after 10.01. Also, I'd like to move the uh, personnel report to the fall or after the closed session. We have a motion to amend the agenda to add a closed session after item 10.01 and then move personnel report after the closed session. Is there a second? Any questions or discussion? All those in favor, please say aye. Aye. Signed up to speak. First is Mr. Robert McLean. Madam Chairwoman, board members, Dr. Bowles. My comments tonight are to provide rebuttal to Dr. Bowles' presentation and board member comments at the last meeting. The receipts presented were obviously hand picked. I don't disagree that there was a legitimate reason for the purchases. However, the documentation presented to justify the purchases was not included with the receipts given to the public during, public, during past records requests. Even Dr. Bulls couldn't find the documentation in one of the receipts. But what about the purchases where employees bought fuel for their personal vehicles? What about the purchase of a four-wheeler at Christmas time? What about the instances where purchases were split into multiple transactions so as not to require a purchase order? What about the dozens, if not hundreds, of receipts where employees purchase single or double meals at local restaurants? These were obviously not awards banquets or travel meals. What about the school principal that purchased meals for traveling to away football or basketball games? And what about receipts where the superintendent took individual board members or administrators to lunch? There were no explanation for any of these purchases. Apparently, the state auditor's report was ignored. Section 1 of the report states the school district employees misused procurement cards. Section 2 states, internal control deficiencies contributed to employee misuse of school district assets. Section 3 states, school district employees did not follow policies and procedures. To the average citizen, those headings give a pretty clear description of what happened. But you keep telling us that there wasn't really anything wrong and that we need to move forward. As far as the public knows, only two employees resigned and a third was reassigned and roughly $4,000 and over $36,000 of unauthorized charges were repaid. This is not sufficient disciplinary action. Some of the board members' comments were pretty passionate at the last meeting. Some of you accused certain ones of the public for keeping this credit card issue stirred up. I guess I'm one of those. You indicated that money had been wasted during the credit card investigation and responded to public records requests. We were also liking the children trying to step on and knock down your school system sandcastle. Let me remind you that the public did not cause this situation to happen. It was the employees who abused the system. It was the department heads and directors who also abused the system and allowed it to continue. And it was the superintendent and board who did not immediately stand up, take responsibility, and put this issue to rest three years ago. How much money has been saved because this uh, purchase card issue was brought to the public? You seem to have forgotten that we, the citizens and taxpayers of Cleveland County, own the sand that you're making your sandcastle out of. If you would quit kicking the sand in our face and hear us out, we might just get you some concrete and steel to go with that sand and build a better foundation for our kids. On a final note, just because I and others are challenging the board and administrators on their actions does not mean that we don't support our students and teachers. We're not trying to destroy the system around them, we're trying to make the education environment better. And I ask that my comments be entered into the minutes and the Thank you. Next is Mr. Robert Williams.
April the 14th, 2014. Uh, my comments are very similar to what Mr. Queen just spoke to. Uh, I, would, I, would, I have also asked for uh, public records regarding credit card uh, purchases. My understanding from Dr. Bulls is there are 560,000 such records. I received probably less than 10,000, which is way less than 1% of the total. Uh, <clears throat> for instance, the, uh, the questionable meetings, I've got a folder with this too. You guys look at it. It's all good. Uh, snacks, 204 questions. It goes from there. <clears throat> I filed so far 18 uh, public records requests and by law. I have the right to do that without explanation. I will give an explanation, but I'm interested in, in how our money is spent. The best I can tell there's been tens and hundreds of thousands of dollars that are spent in questionable ways. A meal every now and then would bother me, but this means this more than this just for snacks is too many. That itself raises the question of who's controlling the spending. So far I can't tell that anybody is. Now, <clears throat> whether or not I know at the last meeting uh, there were some comments that you're tired of hearing about public records requests. Well, uh, the law says you will provide public records when they're asked for. And I've asked for them in the proper way, proper manner, under the proper laws. And I expect those records to be provided for me to inspect. So that's that's just how it is. And there's legal there's legal recourse. If you decide you're not going to do that, then I'm prepared to move forward with whatever it takes. And I'd also like to mention something that came to my attention today, that there's a uh, some kind of school travel where 127 students from Kings Mountain are going to the beach, some kind of school function event. Parents are not allowed to come on. I find that trouble. I hope you look into it. Thank you. Miller, members of the board, Dr. Bulls, it's always a pleasure to uh, speak with you. Uh, it's always uh, an added pleasure when we have the opportunity to share good news. Um, and it's appropriate tonight as we share some good news from our consolidated data report that we do this as a team because the news that we'll share with you tonight is not a, a, a reflection of one individual effort. It's not a reflection of one individual school's effort. It's a reflection of the hard work from our administrators, and our teachers, um, that, that work hard with our students every day. Um, this is some exciting information, um, at least I think it's exciting, and our, our team thinks it's exciting, and I think you will as well. As we look at uh, the consolidated data report for our schools and, and direction we're moving. It's working for a good practice. I believe some consistency.
the consolidated report, as you can see, is a large document, and I will email you the link to this exact document. It's 145 pages. But I wanted to highlight a few things about this consolidated data report. Um, it's an annual report produced by uh, the North Carolina Department of Public Instruction uh, to the General Assembly. And in the, the consolidated data report uh, involves uh, things such as school crime and violence, suspensions and expulsions, uh, dropout rates, and corporal punishment. Uh, this report fulfills obligations of General Statute 115C, 12, uh, 21, and 1227, and Section Law 2011-282. Um, the school uh, data report is a, uh, a reference point to analyze correlations between school crime violence, dropouts. Uh, it is a, a combination of reported data that we report every year at the end of the year as far as uh, dropouts, suspensions, expulsions, corporal punishment. Uh, this is self-reported data, and then DPI puts this all in. It basically, the, the idea is to correlate data from suspensions and expulsions to, to uh, academics and dropout. Um, a few things that are, that are contained in the consolidated data report. First of all, reportable offenses. You've probably heard that term before, especially uh, folks that are involved in schools. Uh, there are 16 reportable offenses included in this report. Nine of, out of the 16, they're divided into two categories. Um, nine of the 16 are considered dangerous and violent. And we, we have to report those. Those are reportable offenses that must be reported to law enforcement. Uh, the second uh, chapter in, in this report is suspensions and expulsions. As you know, we do court policy and state law. Short-term suspensions are suspensions that are 10 days or less. Uh, Long-term suspensions are, are suspensions that are greater than 10 days. Uh, and typically, we think about that for the remainder of the school year. Um, expulsions are uh, suspensions in which a child is not allowed to return to school for their career. Um, the third section is the use of corporal punishment. Um, as you know, according to our board policy, uh, corporal punishment is not allowed to be in schools. In fact, there are only nine LEAs that report the use of corporal punishment in their LEA. Now, I will say that not all the LEAs have a uh, policy that, that ban that, but they've chosen not to use it. Only nine report that. Uh, there's also some information in our consolidated data report that uh, speaks to alternative learning placements. Uh, in, in this place, this information is state data only. It doesn't give LEA specific information about placements to the alternative learning programs. As you know, our alternative learning program in Cleveland County is Turning Point Academy. Uh, and then the final uh, piece of information that is included in the consolidated data report is the dropout data. And we we obviously know that we've been able to, to look and compare the, and as we'll show you in just a few minutes, I believe you, your eyes will be uh, open, the, 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 the relationship that suspensions and expulsions have on, on our dropouts Good evening, Mr. Chairman. This is Chairman, <laughs> members of the board, Dr. Bulls. A little different than that seat tonight. A um, couple of things that I do want to address uh, that are on the screen above you. Uh, this is this past school year, the data that we have reported this past school year only. The first one talks about uh, reportable acts. And as Dr. Fisher just mentioned, there's nine that are considered dangerous and violent. None of the ones that were reported uh, were considered uh, dangerous or violent. So of those 131, they were the other uh, ones that are there. These would consist of possession of alcohol, a controlled substance, or maybe a prescription that wasn't uh, delivered to the nurse, or it even could be a, a pocket knife, uh, things like that. Those are what uh, is included in that 131 reportable offenses. Uh, the short-term uh, suspensions is 2964. Uh, Long-term suspension is 26, and in the last two there we had zero expulsions, and we do not do corporal punishment. Uh, that is against board policy. Uh, let me elaborate a little bit on that and show, kind of show you some history. This is a seven-year look. Uh, I'll compare a lot back to 0809 because that has data in all categories. But if you look at that first category, uh, there were short-term suspensions with 2964. If you compare that to last year, uh, it's down 454. If you go back to 0809, it's down over 1,800 uh, from 0809, so that's a tremendous improvement there. Uh, the next line is long-term suspensions. Last year we had 26 of those. It's down eight from the past year, and 86 uh, from 0809, or even more uh, from 0607. Uh, reportable acts has stayed pretty consistent through the years. If you look at that from 132 to 131, that's pretty consistent through the years. It's up a little bit from last year. Uh, but it is down from 08, 09. 
Uh, and then the last two, again, the violent acts, that's a, that's a huge one there. That's a zero. That's what we're shooting for. And then the expulsions, we had zero as well uh, in that area. At this one, I'll turn it over to Mr. Polkman. I have an opportunity to talk to you a little bit about uh, our dropout data. And as you can see, this first slide here shows our historical data for the LEA. Uh, graduation rate uh, is on the first column of dropout rate. And then our actual number of dropouts um, for this past uh, few years. As you can see, uh, if you look at the number of dropouts, uh, we've gone from 381 uh, 2005 6 now to 134 uh, this past year. The graduation rate made 340. So we've continued to see a decline uh, in the number of dropouts that we've had. Of course, just like anything else, the higher you get, the harder it gets to uh, continue to meet the needs of, uh, of those students. Uh, next slide is actually the uh, full last year. Uh, this is Burns Crest, it's a mountain Shelby turn point, and old Shelby as well. Uh, this does break down a male, female, and also by ethnicity. And as you can see there, numbers are six Hispanic, you know, black, 87 white, and 12 multi, which is like two or more. And uh, again, that's the, the breakdown for this. This is also our four-year cohort, which is a different uh, rate um, from the actual dropout rate. As you can see, this is the four-year cohort. This is a student selected in 2009 uh, and actually graduated in 2013. That's where they as you can see, that's broken down on male and female, as well as a lot of groups, subgroups. Um, we are pleased to, uh, as you can see, uh, as far as our black students, at 84%, which is actually higher than uh, our for all students. And, uh, so we're continuing to work to, uh, to give some of those subgroups the, the attention that they deserve to have. And, uh, this is a breakdown uh, as far as the schools are concerned. Again, this is uh, about this uh, high school that we have, uh, including early uh, college and TPA. Uh, as you can see across the board, uh, we continue to be in the, in the high mid 80s uh, at all of our schools. Uh, obviously, the Turner Point Academy uh, is a different scenario. And, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes, but uh, that is the breakdown. As far as improvement strategies, uh, we continue to have uh, student graduation as a priority from our pre-K program, elementary schools, all the way through high school. We understand dropouts and graduation rate is not a high school issue, it is a pre-K 12 issue. Uh, I think that focus has had a tremendous amount of impact um, as we've seen. Uh, high school freshman academies uh, have been a, I feel like an excellent model, uh, especially uh, the first one we had at Shelby High School really provide an excellent model for us across the district. And we've been able to implement a lot of different programs through the freshman academy. The biggest part of that has been providing an adult that has been uh, had an impact on the student's life. That's probably been one of the biggest impacts we've had. Also, our PBIS programs, positive behavior support programs, uh, have also been able to, that goes right back to Dr. Hummel to suspensions and expulsions, etc. Uh, mentoring, uh, we continue to promote mentoring uh, through our outside agencies as well as business people who try to get people to come in, whether it be lunch buddies, uh, or mentoring in high school and high school programs. Also, the, as far as uh, providing some alternative instructional programs at TPA, uh, and I believe that as we continue to see some changes in TPA, we continue to see the graduation rate increase. Um, obviously, last year was our second year graduation the term that be this year. Also our focus program, uh, which is actually at the uh, Job Link Center, uh, which is the Workforce Investment Act. Uh, this is more for uh, prevention uh, for in-school students, but we also have a high school program that helps students that have actually already dropped out to get them back into school or to get them into a GED program or some type of program in the uh, Also, as far as even connect students to go to curricular activities. We saw a good example of that uh, again on our meeting today, as well as work based learning opportunities, job shadowing, uh, internships, lots of different academies that we have um, in the 
career-related fields. Uh, also, our transition programs, especially our FC department, has done an excellent job of really doing it, of providing the support that the students need as they travel from fifth to sixth, as far as the intermediates, uh, from fourth to fifth, uh, and then as well as in high school, they have those transitions uh, and so tremendously. As well as the uh, College of Career Promise, uh, CCP programs, this is a statewide initiative, as you well know, that uh, allows students to take college courses while they're in high school. And I believe this provides another opportunity and another avenue to connect students that are still in high school to post-secondary education. As well as our Cleveland Railroad College High School, uh, that high school itself was set up uh, really in a way to be able to meet the needs of students that whose parents. A lot of those parents uh, never graduated from college or had an opportunity to go to college. And that was a whole lot different than that. But, so I believe I, these are just a handful of strategies that I feel it really had an impact. Uh, of course, obviously, there's a lot of other stuff that happened individually in each of our schools. So, I'm going to turn it back over to Dr. Fisher. Thank you, Mr. Fogman. As you can see, uh, in summary, suspensions are down, which is a great thing. Uh, and, and graduation rate is up. If you remember from our previous conversations, uh, Clinton Kent School graduation rate is 83.3, the highest it's been ever. Uh, the first time that we've exceeded uh, the state average, and we're excited about that. Um, that's not high enough, as you know, in our strategic planning. We mentioned that our goal, by the, I believe it's by the 2017-2018 uh, school year, uh, our goal was to be uh, over 90%. Uh, I hope that I can come to you well before 2018, 17, 18, tell you that our, our uh, graduation rate is exceeding 90%. That's our goal. But I look at numbers like this, uh, we talk, um, it, it makes me excited to see suspensions go down, long-term suspensions go down, uh, and graduation go up. But it also makes our, our team hungry, uh, makes our principals hungry, makes our teachers hungry, makes our administrators and staff hungry, because we know that when we see those positive results, we can continue to work, continue to get those positive results. I think uh, Mr. Fogelman hit the nail on the head, and, and there's lots that we could, we could talk for, uh, for hours about strategies, and I've, I've shared it before, I don't believe there's one silver bullet that, that cure everything. Um, and, and our team, when I say our team, our Cleveland County Schools team, uh, big team, it does a great job in, in looking at all this. But I do believe that that strategy at the beginning that, that Mr. Fogel mentioned is a pre-K-12 initiative to look at graduation and post-secondary preparedness for our students. And that is one of the major focuses. If you go in our elementary schools, our middle schools, our high schools, you see that every day. You, you can, can't help but see that uh, that focus on high school graduation and post secondary preparedness. So um, I have, I will give you the link to uh, this lengthy document. Uh, I don't believe Dr. Wilson will give you a test or anything on it, but he may. Uh, so uh, I know you guys will all read that. Uh, and if you have any questions, we will, we will be glad to entertain some questions this evening. Uh, as you work through that document, if you look through that, uh, we would be glad to have any questions. Feel free to give me a call. Uh, directly related to dropout data, which program does that uh, for our county, and uh, Dr. Hunter handles the suspension stuff, but we'll be glad to, either one of us will be glad to, to help you with any questions. But, uh, are there any questions tonight? Sure. Uh, Dr. Fisher, uh, just wanted to just offer my comments because uh, in the past, uh, I will concede that I have been very little concerned in the past. Sometimes we're very vulnerable you know, in some of the uh, statistics uh, as it was addressing you know, some of our kids. And, uh, but I must say that in light of the, this report, I've been very impressed and very pleased with the favorable trend, you know, going into the next, particularly with the expulsion, suspensions. Uh, obviously, the graduates made that long time high. And I do attribute that to the effective strategies, the cooperation, the collaboration between all the stakeholders, both internal stakeholders and external outside of the I think all that has played a factor. And I also think the leadership being intentional, being focused uh, to make sure that we you know, have some impact and some positive outcomes. And this is a result of that. So I've been very pleased and certainly want to commend the leadership for this effort. Mr. Sir, the reports and the Right direction, whether they were coming up or going down, they were in the right direction. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. One thing that, that, that's 
not in the report, but I know you won't have data, but I'm just sort of asking for your sense. The number of the reportable acts actually went up from, from 2012 to 2013. They're still good numbers. They yes. went up. But short term suspensions and long term suspensions both in the 90s. Kids sometimes get suspended for criminal acts, sometimes they get suspended for the non criminal acts. Can I conclude from that that the number of students being suspended for non criminal acts went down even more? That's not part of the crime report. That's, that's certainly what it looks like. That would be a fair assumption that those actions. Uh, and, and I just real quickly to briefly address that, I believe that, that you know, we talk about our positive behavior and intervention support schools um, and really working with those schools to teach replacement behaviors. And the idea of, of, of teaching those replacement behaviors. And many times, as you remember, sometimes those short term suspensions or small suspensions were for, you know, uh, small things that repetitive behaviors. And instead of uh, those behaviors, we really worked with our, our counselors and our teachers and our staff to teach replacement behaviors. So instead of uh, a student maybe smarting off to a teacher uh, or being disrespectful for a teacher that may have gotten suspended, they were taught a replacement behavior, how to handle their anger and their frustration, and how to handle that appropriately um, as we talk through. And, and that helps as we you know, transition to graduation. They, they obviously, students can't go to a job and, and, and uh, smart off or be disrespectful to a boss. And so we try to teach those skills, those replacement behaviors. Uh, and that's, I think that's been a real uh, uh, benefit to look at our short-term suspension. But a short answer to your question is, is yes, those, those non-credible behaviors uh, have significant um, I'd like to say, first off, very full of guys. Um, I think it is, uh, like you said, Dr. Fisher does make us more hungry. Um, we see the improvements that we can make. I guess this question would be more directed to um, Dr. Hunnell. Um, when it comes to um, the, the breakdown of the suspensions, um, is there a way that we can dig even deeper into it as far as, um, you know, breakdown of those suspensions, maybe by gender, race? Is there, um, do you have that? Absolutely. Uh, and, and the document that Dr. Fisher is going to send to you, that is in there uh, as well. It does break it down uh, to different areas. Uh, when you look at uh, short-term suspensions, uh, white males lead that category actually with 1,100. Uh, black males uh, are second with 874. With the long-term suspensions, it's white males again with 16 and uh, black males with 8. But it does break it down in the report. Uh, if you do pull it up, it breaks it down to Hispanic, American, Indian, white, Multiracial and that was the idea. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Thank you. Mr. Stark, please put more on that page too. I'll put more on that page as well so you can go to the back. All right. Thank you. One quick question. I know we have positive behavior support program in a lot of our schools, but they're not in all of our schools. Is that correct? Can you see a difference between the reports from a school that has the positive behavior support group? Uh, can you see a lot of differences? There, there are some differences. Um, you know, one of the things that I, I see and have done the discipline for a long period of time is the positive behavior and support is, is a fantastic program. But there are many principles that within that program that schools are you know, taking on that um, they may not be a PBI in school, but they adhere to those philosophies, they adhere to the reteaching. They, they adhere to those, some of those strategies, and so they're reaping the benefits for the, for the work that's being done. Our, our counselors, uh, our student support uh, services uh, employees really preach that, whether it's a PBIA school or not. Our behavioral liaisons who work in all of our schools are, are well trained in those areas. So even if a school's not a possible behavior intervention support school, uh, they reap the benefits from having uh, that. Um, our number of PBIA schools. So I envision that before long, we'll, we'll, uh, all of our schools will move in that direction. We're fortunate, uh, one of the few districts to have uh, several high schools. Uh, Shelby High School has done a remarkable job over the last uh, year doing some presentations at the state and national level with their PPIS program. Crest High School, which is here tonight, uh, is a school that's moving to PPIS next year. So uh, we, we have a, a, a good group of schools that are PPIS, but even the ones that are not PPIS, really adhere to many of those successful strategies. Well, I, I was at Sherman High when they did a presentation to the, uh, to the school visit. I was very well impressed with that program and, and, and staff there. And it seems like every school that we go to, the, that's one of their topics that the school improvement team always 
talk about and it's always you can always see the results of it. So I think it is a good program but I also understand even though they're not classified as that particular school, they like, use the use the practices of this year. I'd like to just commend you for the improvement. Uh, when I look back at those uh, years previously, back when there were 4,500 suspensions, I probably counted for quite a few of those over the years. And I realized how hard it is for our states, how, that, how hard they were to cut these suspensions. Because and a lot of it comes down to simply getting the kids to want to be in school, getting them to be engaged in learning. And if you can get the kid interested in learning, then they don't have time to do all the junk that, that, that gets in the trouble. And that's a big change, and I think that was reflected very much on a graduation road. But also the fact that we put so many alternatives in for the principals to use and for the teachers to use, and we frame the teachers and the, the principals and the whole staff of how do we deal with these problems without just saying, go home and have a vacation for 10 days. Because a lot of kids didn't look at it as a Hey, that's a nice way to get out of school. Get a vacation for 10 days. Easter vacation wasn't long enough, so give me an extra 10 day vacation. And uh, so I really think it's uh, it to be commended for the, uh, our whole staff for the work that they put into in cutting these numbers. Because uh, that's really significant and it really makes a huge difference in our graduation rate and our students. Thank you, Gary. Oh, excuse me. Do we look at our security when on these suspensions and like it's a dual suspension, for example, like a bike? Do we look at our security camera that we have in our hallways and our wherever to to try to pen, uh, to set who started that bike? Our, our administrators do use those security cameras, and our, our administrators do use um, you know all the resources they have um, at their disposal to make sure that we. Uh, not only um, you know discipline students and have a suspension, but but the other end of that, one of the things that we try to focus on is is you know um, there's a few decided discipline, but there's also a uh, a teaching component. And I know it's easy for me in the curriculum instruction world to always come back to the instructional teaching component. But as we as we have that suspension, we also must uh, be able to come back and, and teach and, and correct and improve that behavior and teach that replacement. Um, because we understand that suspending students is not the answer because if it was, then we would solve all the problems real quickly and we wouldn't have any repeat offenders. But, but, but that education component, that instructional component is really what changed the paper. And I think as well as what you put it to. And the end result is a great graduation rate, which we're very proud of. And I, as you, as you uh, go through any other day, we'll be glad to answer any questions you may have on the dropout day.
adoption of the contract. I'll say. We have a motion and a second to approve the one-year contract. Second. 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 Vice Chair, members of the board, Dr. Walls, you have had the budget document since your April the 14th meeting. We ended that meeting with basically uh, saying that um, 
if you wanted to give us some direction or suggestions or seek additional uh, information, please do so. So we come to you tonight basically uh, wanting to uh, take any direction or discussion that you may have, anything that we can do to clarify anything within the budget, then ultimately you have the option to either direct us to go back and do some other things or you could, if you uh, choose to do so, adopt the budget. I would like to uh, point out a few things within the budget and uh, Mr. Lee, if I can interrupt you, if you explain the board, because we've got a few couple of board members about our timetable for the county commission. Okay. Uh, by May 15th, we have to have the budget to the county commissioners. So you will need to adopt the budget prior to the 15th with uh, any changes that uh, you want us to make to this budget by that date. Uh, the county commissioners have from May the 15th until June the 30th to uh, set a tax rate and adopt the budget. Sometimes that goes beyond that date, pending action at the general assembly level because they simply can't approve the budget. I don't know what is straight from the beginning. But those are the, the statutory uh, dictates, if you will, or deadlines that we have to, to abide by. So uh, you could choose to. Uh, seek additional information at the May 12th meeting, but you would have to adopt uh, the budget at that meeting there so that we could, in fact, meet the uh, commissioner's deadline. For your information, uh, the superintendent's uh, budget message will give you a, a quick overview of the budget, the scope of it, and the feel of the budget. Uh, Dr. Bulls does a great job of, with that, and that will give you uh, a broad picture view of the budget and what the changes are in the budget. I would uh, tell you that if you go to the table of contents, all of those items on the left-hand side of the, uh, the two columns there are basically background information. It's just for you to go through and to be able to, to better understand the data that's presented later on in the budget book. And then the items on the right-hand column of the uh, table of contents, beginning with the purpose code, those are basically five different views of the budget data that will give you the three previous years history, what the actual um, expenditures were for the pre three previous years, what the current adopted budget is at this level of, of the year, and what our projected balances are for the uh, remainder of the year. And then the final call there is what the budget request in this budget proposal is for, for, for uh, this budget. And the purpose code is basically the level that you legally adopt the budget uh, later on. And when you go to the very last document, the resolution, that's really just a, a real formal document that is reflected of the purpose uh, description of the budget. But the purpose code is, is there. It uh, has definitions for your uh, benefit. The program codes basically is a second view of the budget and it is more broadly uh, defined, but you can look at uh, that and determine, okay, exceptional children, how much do we expend on exceptional children? Because it's got the PRCs out there for that, those expenditures. The next view is the object code, and that is really the exact level that you're spending your money. So if you want to look to see how much you're spending for certified salaries in any particular fund, or instructional for non-certified salaries, and you can look at the object view of the budget. The location uh, view of the budget is again by school, so you can look to see how those expenses all break down by school. And then the final one is the fund manager view, and that is basically the level at, at civil office that directors control those budgets and, and who uh, uh, basically is the responsible person for those budgets. But anyway, that's uh, five different views of the same budget data to try to give you a better understanding of how the money comes in and how the money is spent within the system. I would be more than happy to uh, try to respond to any questions or take any direction that you may want to give us at this point in time. Thank you, Mr. Lee. Um, as Mr. Lee said, we have had the budget since our last meeting. And I think what I'm hearing is that we, we can approve it tonight if we want to, but we don't have to. We do have one more meeting. That is correct. Then the 
that does put a tighter timeline, I guess, in looking at different measures. Does anyone have some questions for this committee or suggestions? Or? Mr. Lee, our, our low wealth funding was cut last year by $750,000 and then an additional $650,000 this year. Said it before, we don't have much money to do with the county. So I assume the state has changed the formula on that. Is that accurate? I don't know. Okay. Uh, Either way, we got less money. We, we, we did. We got less money. And uh, we did not get the the actual planning block until right before the budget came out. That's the reason we really couldn't uh, get the budget to you a week or two before the last. Uh, the earlier meeting this month because the, the state had not released any planning law so now it came out the Friday before we actually did the budget in that process so we haven't seen the detail for what the uh, backs up the for planning law for the low wealth it doesn't feel like we're wealthier than we were but it was a $750,000 cut last year and a $650,000 cut this year and to compensate for that we're going to have Commissioners, I know that's part of the request for a bank reserve. That that is all people is, is what it really is. It's all classroom teachers that are in that PRC. We don't use low wealth for uh, supply allotments or anything like that. It's all people. It's all personnel. So we will have to make adjustments in some form or fashion, yes. Commissioner Harris, if I might add to that, the, the low wealth formula is the power of make this agreement, but I think it's the most complicated the formulas with which we deal. Uh, I've been on that low wealth committee for a few years and it is difficult. But it really is, in a simplistic term, it really is looking at our county's wealth, um, our tax burden, and a comparison of those two, a ratio of those two. And there are some things I think, and I've said this to our faculty when I went around to one of our faculty meetings or our campuses last fall and spoke to each faculty and shared with them that we were losing low wealth money. Shared with them my concern for that because it is a fund. I think at the high mark we were better than $6 million in low wealth money. We put 100% of that in classroom teachers. Every school district doesn't do that. We've chosen to do that so that we have more teachers in lower class sizes. But I predicted then that as we've had some of these major economic investments, which seem to be a good thing, and I'm not certainly not opposed to those, but they are changing the tax base and making our county, at least from a uh, at the tax basis, more wealthy. And consequently, that's affecting our, our ratio of tax burden to, to wealth. And so that's coming into play. To put this on the point of the mm -hmm. we, have, we have some investments in our county that have been a billion dollars uh, in terms of I will call them the names of those companies because I don't want that, that's a good thing that they're doing that. But, but those billion dollar investments are impacting our county's wealth. And so that is what is, I think, impacting the very well. And we'll continue to do so. The question is do we want those? Absolutely. You know, if we can have those investments in our community, those are good things. But it's going to affect this low wealth. We're not the only county that's been impacted by this. And Really, it's designed as a mechanism, uh, and, and it came along about the time of the end, but you all are familiar with that, you know the issue there. Uh, it came along as a mechanism to equalize the funding in lower wealth counties. And um, there's been a great deal of talk about that. The formula has not changed. It has been how, at least in my terms, 15 years of superintendent, it has changed. Has been well, there have been more funds applied to the state certainly, but um, I think what's happened is our conditions here. We've had several years where we had to call to the attention of folks in Raleigh that yes, you need to include our supplemental tax because that is a tax that our citizens are paying, and so that is part of our tax burden. That's a part of the point. You can't exclude that, and so we've had to say you need to include that because our, our citizens are paying uh, their share of this, and so. Going to help, uh, but every you know, fifty to sixty thousand dollars we lose in that—that's a teaching position. It, it, 
it does become a bit of a political football. Uh, your counties where the military bases are, are housed have, have been um, held harmless to a certain extent in, in some cases. And you've had some larger counties that uh, are getting close to funding out and the legislature has come, come through and held some of those homeless. So it does become a little political, but, but in theory, the form is, is still the same. It just doesn't feel the same. One of the things I found a bit of disturbing was looking at the uh, utility bill. The fact that uh, if new power actually gets its increase that they're asking for, it's going to cost us a third of a million dollars, more three hundred fifty thousand dollars more for next year. That's pretty major if you gets the, the raise, the, the rate increase, and uh, then even more surprising, I guess I need to look at my own budget when they talk about the state tax goes on. Uh, increase on the electric rate. I, know it, I knew it was going to hit at home uh, on July 1. We're going to start paying extra sales tax on our, our utility bill. But when I look at the effect on the school system and see that we're going to be paying $300,000 extra back to the state in sales tax uh, of electricity that we're using, uh, that's, pretty, that's pretty significant. We're talking almost two thirds of a million dollars just for utilities. And that was part of the philosophical approach to the, uh, the, the tax cut that was enacted last year. It wasn't really to take in less money, it was to take money in from different people. Any other questions? Just really quick, I, I'd say, um, first off, thank you for your work. I, I, I don't give me your position at all. Um, this is a, a huge budget, so you guys have done a spectacular job on it. Um, I guess my question would be towards, as I go around schools and travel, um, of course we built a pretty heavy classroom with potential assistance, um, you know, getting cut. Um, and I know at the last meeting you did tell us that this budget does not anticipate that there will be any more cuts to our teacher's assistance, is that correct? That is correct. Um, I guess my question is, can you shed a little light on the potential, and I know they've been cut back a couple hours. Now, this is not me wanting to get, you know, any wishful thinking or anything. I just wanted to know about the possible potential of raising that up, or any maybe adding an hour or something to our teacher systems. How possible is that? How impossible is it? What is your opinion? Uh, this is an overly simple thought explanation, uh, Mr. Thurman, but. That budget is basically about $4.3 billion, and, and basically our TAs are six hours a day. So if you look at that at being six, $700,000 is what's going to cost you to raise an hour in, in those, those positions. And that's really simplistic, but that's reasonable. Have any other questions? Just, just one brief comment. Even though I think this is somewhat of a meaningless antidote, but uh, when we look at uh, where we are with our budget uh, versus where we were five, six years ago, we are operating at $300 million less than what we were. I didn't hear everything, Mr. Hooker, I'm sorry. That uh, in light of where we are with our budget today uh, for this proposed budget, that we are operating with uh, at uh, level that is three hundred million dollars less than what we were five or six years ago. From the state level, yeah. yeah from the state Absolutely. Base. If you go back to two thousand eight, which was the high point of, of school funding in, in North Carolina with the uh, 2013-14 adopted budget, you're beginning to rebound to about where it was five or six years actually previous to that. So that's it's just reality. And population statewide is considerably up in 2008.
uh, county commissioners actually adopt the budget and set a tax rate. Whenever the General Assembly finally adjourns and sets a budget, we'll bring back to you a budget that will use this as a starting point, but it will reflect what was actually uh, legislated at local and state level, and, and we'll bring that budget back to you brand new again. And, and, but it, it will start from this basis, uh, unless you give us some other direction. But uh, in August or September, you will really adopt the budget that will be used for the 14-15 uh, school year. Right. Right. With that, uh,
which last week when we did the Indianapolis fall. We have our first place in electronics for Skills with USA, which we'll be doing in Kansas City here in about two weeks. So we've had some other opportunities to go national. Stated it, not stated it. The college board have been talking about having an AP class and accounting and business and all that. So that's still at the talking stage. Actually, it continues to move forward uh, more and more each about every six months. We're getting up there. Uh, it looks like it won't be next year, uh, but it's a good possibility that it will be for the 2015-16 school year. And uh, we are hoping to uh, press high school to be able to put about that. Well, that's the point of having several ways to college career. Well, I've heard a lot of teachers say a lot of good things about you and your role uh, leading that vocational department. And uh, I want to thank you for what you do. And I know the teachers really appreciate what you do. And keep giving them all you can give them so they can keep this going. This is what I'll give them a lot. Thank you, sir. And that's good to recognize those teachers. Trying to remember the terminology, but it's that workforce readiness certification. Uh, Wanted to inquire about our, our, how is our participation. I know several years ago when we first adopted that, we were leading the state in the, the number of students participating in that. And haven't heard any data lately about how well, we're doing with that. One of the reasons why is basically it's now part of the accountability model for the state of Carolina. And uh, what we do is we actually provide the career readiness certificate for work needs. Uh, to all of our CTE concentrators, we have our students that have completed the four unit concentration, you know, prepared for program area, which is a carpentry or a lot of and they take the test. Uh, and what we uh, basically at this point in time, with, uh, the numbers are pretty well stay the same as far as our gold, silver, and bronze. Uh, the state actually, as far as accountability, is not recognizing gold and silver. Uh, we are doing a, a little bit of a side project. Clearwater. Uh, Clearwater gives their uh, entrance exam that they have for their employers. And we're actually uh, taking a sample of our students and allowing them to take that test and trying to do some rationale and correlation there uh, as far as their test and their employees and similar matches up and similar. But uh, it still is providing some opportunities for students. And we have about 600 of them tested. Mm -hmm. Good evening. Uh, bring greetings from Shelby High School tonight, and uh, obviously, uh, we'll give you some information on those schedule changes at Shelby High School for next school year. Our current schedule, just to remind you, we are on a modified traditional schedule, we call it. Uh, it is a five year long period with one block period in the middle of the day that we rotate with lunch. So, students have an opportunity to take seven courses in the course of uh, complete school year, but at any one time they're taking six courses. Uh, so graduates must earn 24 credits out of the possible 28 credits at Shelby High uh, during the four years at Shelby High School. Uh, question is why would we change our uh, schedule? Uh, we're looking for increased flexibility, uh, more opportunities for our struggling students. Uh, an example there would be uh, the possibility of doing a math 1A and 1B. Those would be 90 minute year long sections. So in other words, instead of uh, what we currently might offer, uh, math one in a, in a block, 90 minute block class, or in a year long traditional 55 minute class, this would be an opportunity for the student to take that over the course of the entire year for the 90 minutes. Um, we 
realized that our friends at Crest Barnes and Kings Mountain have used that to some extent and have had success with that. And so that's one of the practices that we would like to, uh, to copy from them. Other things that would be involved would, would be some intervention periods. We've used those this year, both in English and math. We feel like that those are going to be successful. The results are, are not in yet, so we're not sure exactly where we stand with those, but, but we think that those have been successful uh, periods for those students that are struggling. And so this will give us opportunities to use those classes more as well. Um, another example there, the third bullet is opportunities for to take additional courses. Uh, this will get us online with the other three high schools in the district in terms of having the opportunity to take 32 courses over the four years instead of 28. I said, what's it look like? Well, believe it or not, this is something that I kind of came up with on my own and threw it out for uh, a lot of folks to look at and to tear apart and to make suggestions and whatnot, and we pretty much left it alone, and we, we think it's going to work. We're, we're still not 100% certain. Ms. Montgomery starts her scheduling uh, party tomorrow, I guess we'd say, here at the central office, and so uh, she's going she's gonna to come back to me and, and, and either kill me or, or uh, we're going to have a good time figuring it out. But the, basically what, what, we're, what we're doing, and, and I know it's maybe confusing to look at, but we're basically overlaying six year-long uh, sections over a block schedule. So um, we didn't do eight year-long sections over four blocks. We did, we left one block alone, which is what we're currently doing with our, uh, what we call our fourth period now. Uh, that would be the third period that you see on the screen. Uh, first, second, and fourth period each would have, not only would the students have an opportunity possibly to take a block class, but we would have the year-long uh, opportunity there. Well, did, uh, additional benefits of adding the block, additional time allows for labs, cooperative learning activities, additional learning strategies on a daily basis. Uh, many students will have multiple blocks, therefore fewer classes to focus on at one time now. I don't know exactly what that's going to look like. We won't know until we get the schedule built, but I'm kind of thinking that most students would have five classes at a time instead of six. I know that's only a reduction of one. But for students that are struggling, that's a big reduction. Um, so we're expecting to see that. Potentially, I guess there is the chance that a kid could go down to the four and be on a regular uh, four by four block schedule like what we see over Chris. Um, I don't anticipate that being for very many students, but it is possible. Um, opportunities to recover failed courses immediately in the following semester, that especially important if you're a senior. That fails English first semester or fails math first semester and needs that to graduate, uh, they wouldn't be in a situation where they had to go to summer school to recover that. They would be in a situation where they can move that, that course in the spring semester and possibly still uh, recover it in time to graduate. Students can have a fresh start. Uh, I think that's one of the things that we've learned about our block class that we've had for the last several years is that uh, teachers and students kind of like being able to have a fresh start in January and this will give more students an opportunity for that. And then the final one there, I told our assistant principals in charge of, uh, and I've been in that boat before, the, the assistant principal in charge of enrollments. When we get enrollments after January 15th or after the end of the first semester, it's very difficult when a kid comes in off a block schedule and then they come to our traditional or modified traditional schedule. Uh, it's hard for us to schedule in order to, you know, let them finish out the year. So this obviously would ease transitions. And, and we do have a number of students that move. Uh, I think Shelby High and Crest High probably share the most students or have the most students that go back and forth. Uh, at least that's what we see in our office. And, and this would obviously ease those transition uh, for those students that do have to move uh, during the school year. Uh, benefits continue with added sections. Classes could be smaller. I'm not so sure about that as I've been trying to put my, my numbers together. It's not working out like I had hoped. So uh, I, I've got that one on there because I'm still kind of keeping my fingers crossed. Um, I think we're going to see some class size reduction in the course of the subject areas, but our uh, electives have absolutely blown up with uh, adding an additional course. Um, and then the last one here, Coach Ware's not here to help me explain this one tonight, but uh, athletes are required to have 10 core subjects uh, by the NCAA before the beginning of their seventh semester. So that's the end of their junior year or the beginning of their senior year. So obviously by adding one additional course per year, a student would have three additional opportunities uh, to, to meet that 10 core requirement by the time they finish their junior year. So that just gives students more opportunities to get the job done that they need to if 
and they do intend to continue on uh, at college level in sports. And I know that's a small level, a uh, small number still. So we're, we're looking at about 10 or 12 this year that are actually moving on to the next step of playing college athletics. But, but it does make a difference for those 10 or 12 students. Why not give up a year long altogether? Well, that's 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 some, not not something that the faculty at Shelby High School is willing to consider at this point. Um, our AP program, our Fine Arts program, uh, our uh, World Language Languages program, those are areas that we feel like still need that year long everyday contact for 180 days and not the block. Uh, so, uh, also the continuity of sequential courses, the math one, two, three, uh, the new American history one and two. Those are things that we feel like. You know, there's some of those could be on the block and be uh, very well served on the block, but we still yeah. like that that year long uh, continuity for a lot of those classes. That's pretty much it. Questions? Just the, um, since I've been at Shelby High School, when I first came, we were six periods, year long, all day, no blocks. Then we went to a seven period day. Then when we added the block, we basically at that point, we couldn't handle lunch anymore with as many students as we had at that time, and we needed additional lunch periods, so we added that block to help us incorporate lunch. Um, really is the reason we added it at that time, and, and we just stayed with that schedule. Are you doing something like a smart lunch day? We, we did not have the smart lunch at this time, and, and we're kind of keeping our eyes on Kings Mountain to see what's going on right there. We might, we might come back to you later with that information. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Well, I'll be in the half of uh, the It was always about that is the transportation issue. Most of the time, the reason we get a kid at the semester, even from Crest or Burns, is because the family can't provide the transportation for them to stay at their that home school for the rest of the year. And because of that, well, you know, if we talk about a reduced schedule, like we're going to give them a half a day schedule, well, that's a problem because they have a transportation issue. If they didn't have that transportation issue, that parent would have kept them at Burns or King, Kings Mountain Crest and, to start with. And so they need to be there from, from 8 to 3. And, in order for them to be there from 8 to 3, they need something to do from 8 to 3, and so that, that does become difficult. It sure, certainly does, and this should, should help with that. Great. Any other questions? Mr. Just, I'm, I'm, I'm just trying to get my head around So, so a child between the, the time of the 8 o'clock and 9 o'clock, yes, some of your children will be on block schedule. Yes, sir. But other children will be on the skinnies. That's correct. Block. Yes, sir. That will happen except the third period. The third period will be on the block. Everybody will be on the block for third period, yes, sir. So, which, is, which is what we're doing now, except so we don't have the option of the block to any other point of the year or any point of the day except for that lunch period. And with this schedule, you would actually have that option for block all out throughout the day, yes, sir. But you can't do a skinny at the third block. No, sir. Because of lunch. That's correct. Yeah. Or at least that's the way we. Figured it out. I'm not looking at it like you have. It seems to me like you'll need more rooms. Is, is that an issue? No, I don't think so. No, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Uh, and by the way, I just and that's well, I appreciate you asking that question. We um, we did put it up to a faculty vote. Um, I didn't, and, I, and of course, I told them from the very beginning that this would not be uh, a David Allen driven thing. That it needed to be everybody behind it. And, it was an 85 percent of the faculty in support of it, and uh, I, honestly, I was a little worried about 85 percent. I was hoping it was going to be 90 or 95 percent, but but it was 85 percent, and I took it to the school improvement team with the, the vote total, and and, uh, and they voted for us to move forward with it. So I just um, appreciate you asking about Miss Helfinger, but in general, the, the staff is supportive of it. I was going to, um, you know, piggyback on that. Roger did have a question about because um, I 
I know how you really um, love to have that we support when you do something, and I think that's important. Um, just one question on the four period. Um, is that going to increase your day? Are you currently already getting that school three or five? No, we're, it, it, it will increase us by five minutes. By five minutes? Yes, sir. No, man, we, uh, no, 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 that, that's never been the case at all. Actually, this committee was formed, the schedule committee that, we, we, that we've used to study this and to look at a bunch of different options was actually formed last year under Ms. Walker's leadership. Um, obviously, with the change in position the way it happened last fall, or last spring, I should say, uh, with her changing positions and whatnot, that committee kind of just got sidetracked a little bit, so we reinstituted that same committee back in the fall, and they, and they have done the work in, in terms of looking at different schedules and, and you know, uh, kind of just going throughout the whole gamut of what our possibilities were, and that's that's where we came up with this. This, again, even though it was kind of my idea in terms of the times and whatnot, uh, it was a committee approach. Yes, ma'am. Okay. It's approved tonight, and the committee will meet again tomorrow. Well, our next step will be to communicate with our parents. We're thinking about having uh, some town hall type meetings, of course, the next six weeks or school are just jam-packed with all kinds of stuff. I'm not sure how many uh, empty nights we'll be able to find to do that, but we're going to try to communicate that uh, through those and, of course, uh, through our other forms of communication like that. I commend you for stepping out. It was hard work. It's a lot of Well, I hope it'll work. Yes, ma'am. I appreciate it. You might have to tweak something. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. How about the students? Maybe the students that didn't learn any students on this group? No, but I have a fifth period uh, uh, advisory group that I go to with all my uh, ideas. And, uh, it so far has been very, very positive. I'm sure there will be. Uh, the one that lives in my house has already given me a little bit of grief. But, uh, <laughs> most of the students have been very supportive. Mr. Allen, I'd like to say as well, that I think the town halls are a great idea. Uh, I, I would love that we as the board would be invited to some of those or I just like what you're doing and taking the word out to the community. Sure, we'd be glad to do that. Yes, sir. Any other questions? Mr. Allen, this is an action item. Um,
Good evening, members of the board, Madam Chair, Scott Phillips. Um, it's a pleasure to help um, John with, with putting some of this information together. Uh, and as he mentioned, the, the first thing you, the first thing has to be done before you can come to any sort of idea of uh, a cost of the new facility is to find out exactly uh, what will be in that new facility. And this is uh, the slide uh, that's shown now represents um, the information that was gathered from the uh, principal and the administration to put together what it would really take to make North Shelby School exactly what North Shelby School needs to be. And um, you can see, I won't go line by line, but you can see that um, the, the bottom line is around 59,000 square feet. Uh, just to, to put that in perspective, size-wise, compared to New Shelby Middle School, New Shelby Middle School is around 130,000 square feet or so, so it's considerably small. Um, uh, and in addition to that, of course, they've been fortunate enough to have the, um, the riding ring out there at North Shelby. Um, and I, I might just mention that over the years, I've been very fortunate um, to have spent a fair amount of time on that campus. We've done several projects over there. And um, to see the work that these people do, uh, it is really incredible. I told a lot of people, I said that everybody or anyone who pays taxes in Cleveland County should go spend a couple hours at North Shelby School and they would really appreciate just what uh, the school system is doing for these children. Uh, it's an incredible uh, job that those, uh, that faculty does it there. This represents what it would take to give them what they need with a little bit of room for growth, but it's not, a, uh, uh, not an enormous room for growth that gives them the, the room to function like they need to function. So, with this information, uh, we were asked to put together the cost of a new facility. So, using historical data that we have from some of the other school projects that we have and some other things. Uh, the uh, budget uh, was developed and uh, ends up being around $10.2 million to do, to give them the space, <coughs> space that they need, including their um, uh, equestrian center, including additional space that they need for cover drop-off because of the, uh, the needs that these kids have, uh, as well as the playground, which I know is a really important thing to uh, the parents and to the children at that facility. So uh, we ended up with uh, a total of around 10.2, but that does not include the land acquisition because obviously we don't know a number to plug in for the land acquisition. Uh, then, as, as uh, Mr. Yarbrough mentioned, uh, we were told we wanted to really look at all the different alternatives and uh, we had to look at what it would, uh, the, the financial impact of going to the existing site because you've already got a lot of square footage there, you've already got an established uh, program at that site and see what uh, it would, uh, what it would take to renovate and to add on to uh, the existing facility. So this is a, a rough site plan uh, that um, gives you a little bit of an idea of this campus. The, the lighter shaded area on the site plan is new instructional space. The, the one thing that, that the attempt was made to try to compare apples and apples as much as possible, which is a little bit difficult to do when you're going to an existing facility, uh, compared to a new facility, but the, one of the things that is extremely important for this population is to be able to get from one place to the other without having to go outside, without having obviously steps. All those things are, are uh, really a big issue for the students. So part of this was to see, okay, how can we connect all these various buildings that now, uh, for the most part, are uh, not connected, or if they are, they're just not covered walls blowing rain and the cold air, there's a lot of issues uh, uh, surrounding these spaces. So the darker shaded areas are the connector areas um, that put all these pieces together. 
Um, as I mentioned, the, the, the hope was to try to get as close of an apples and apples comparison. However, one thing that's not evident on this slide is in this facility, we're dealing with multiple finished floor elevations. We've got, uh, they're, they're going down ramps, up ramps to get from one place to another. Uh, so in this particular case, the renovation, even if it was a very economical fix, is not an optimum fix for these kids. It doesn't, um, it doesn't provide the environment that this particular population would really thrive in. Uh, it, it's, it's, uh, there's compromises to this. Uh, so we looked at this, uh, and as I, I mentioned to Ms. Yarbrough when we first were working these numbers, I fully expected the renovation option to be a less expensive option. It just, uh, it seemed to me that that was going to be less expensive. I swear we had lots of square footage. But I felt like the, the benefits of a new campus would probably outweigh those financial uh, uh, considerations. However, when you look at the uh, total budget for the renovation, I was really rather surprised to see that the renovation um, is uh, almost a million dollars more than the new facility. Now again, the new facility didn't include the land this, there would be no land purchase in this. Um, and the, the difference in the numbers, the classroom, the new classroom additions, the exact same cost. The connector piece is a much more expensive uh, uh, construction because we're tying multiple buildings together. There's real issues with that that, that make it, they can't, the contractors can't uh, build away. There's a lot of time and effort goes into that. Um, and the existing facility is in need of major renovation. Um, so you add all that together and the total budget um, comes up to about 11.2. And there you see a comparison of the two. Um, and again, this was really rather surprising uh, that the um, renovation of the existing facility would actually be more than the, uh, the new facility. There's no question, again, having spent the, the time that I've spent at North Shelby School, which is the best solution for these children and for these uh, teachers and administration at this facility. Um, the, the new facility would enable, uh, enable it to be designed for uh, easy access to all the different parts of the building, being under cover and in uh, uh, conditioned space the entire time. Uh, the renovation would solve the undercover and conditioned space, but you still have the multiple levels that uh, the students would have to navigate to go from one building to the next. Um, not to mention the, the roundabout method in which they had to get, in some cases, from point A to the point B. Um, but um, again, the, there's a time and place for renovation of the existing facility. I think the, the facility that we're in tonight is an example of that. There's no way that the functions of this facility could have been done at the cost that this was done in a new facility. It would have been uh, a tremendous amount more to try to put all the functions of this facility into a new building. However, in this case, um, to accomplish what needs to be accomplished with these kids, uh, it would be more economical to start a new, uh, new campus. So I'd be glad to answer any questions that you might have. The original building up there was what, early 60s? It's been added on different times. I, I, I'm thinking that's right. I think that it's close to 50 years old, the original building. I think, I think so you're right. You'd be looking at renovating a 50 year old building uh, with the students in it very much of the construction. Well, I, 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 yeah, I appreciate you, you mentioned that. That's that one option, one point that I did fail to mention is that um, one just logistical problem would certainly be the construction and the, the uh, renovation of the existing campus trying to keep those kids in class. Uh, 
there's not a good option for that. Thank you for your presentation. Can you tell me why, uh, specifically on the engineering and architecture, when you look at the two with the renovation and the new, why does it uh, rise to 7.5%? Because typically when you do a renovation, the, um, uh, the um, expense for taking a, a building and doing the type of renovation addition we're talking about doing there, it, it takes a lot more time than doing a brand new building. It takes more um, more engineering, the, the mechanical the plumbing uh, fees are higher. Uh, the rule of thumb is typically 2% more for architectural engineering fees for a major renovation as opposed to the same dollar amount uh, for new construction. Right. Yes. And you said the new campus would have less square footage. Is that I, but, I should have if I didn't, but you're exactly right. But I'm sure there's a lot of wasted space on that that we could use because of the situation that we're in. So yes, so the, the, the renovation, um, when you renovate the space, it cannot be used as efficiently as a newly designed and newly laid out space. So there are inefficiencies in the square footage to be used. Uh, on the existing, I think it's up in about 10,000 square feet more, or give or take. But, uh, but you're exactly right. The, the, uh, the renovation, they would end up with more square footage, but it just would be uh, as, as useful as starting out with a new, uh, new facility. What's amazing there on that campus is uh, to remove some of those low units, we're going to have to be, we have to be pretty creative to get them out of this. There will there, be a few trains involved, I believe. <laughs> um, and, and you mentioned the motor units. I remember um, a number of years back before a lot of those went out there, um, they had a nice ball field there. There's still part of that ball field left, but uh, the, with the site plan that obviously uh, we're eating up about every bit of space they have, and there would be no ball field for the students that could use that uh, at the existing facility, whereas at a new site, the, they could be planned where they could have outside play area. Uh, about the only thing they would have left at, at the existing facility would be the accessible playground that they have now if it's stay there. Also, on the new facility, what kind of acreage would we need around 25 acres or maybe more than that? I'm not real really sure at that point, but I would say it would be somewhere around 20 to 30 acres. Yeah.
earlier in the work session. That was easier, I think, uh, to create that information, come up with that information, because we know that this is going to be new construction with some modifications that build. This is taking a little bit longer. So we're not asking for any decisions tonight. We, you all know my approach to this is we give it to you. You give plenty of time to think about it, talk about it, uh, ask questions, hold over. I think certainly you know, the next work session we close the time to this and come close to June that you can discuss it further, ask more questions. Sort of the next step if if this is the direction we can go, if it is to, to, to do new construction, we need to authorize staff to start looking at the sites. And it's been typically we do come back to you, come back to you with a number of potential sites, see what's out there, and you know, decide what the parameters are around you like those sites to be and go from there. But there's a long way, and that's what I'm going to say to you tonight. If you decided in June that that's the direction you're going to take, we're talking about probably two to three years from the time we start down that road until we would occupy the building. And this could be a, a year or more of construction, probably 18 months. Roger may just speak to that or can speak to that sort of better than I. But this is the starting point. Is your number one project on that priority list, and so we'll be asking you soon for some questions on that as soon as June is what you want the staff to do and to get to look at it. And so tonight is just an introduction. Process through this, 
they typically call me the next day and they ask. Uh, I just ask that they put it in writing. And I would ask them to do that and then we just set up a meeting with you guys. I'd love to have that here. I just would be personally, uh, you want to know. we want to try to do that before the summer. So the thing is, and if they do that in the next couple of days, we can try to set that up for the next meeting. All right, thank you. Next, Mr. Shaw is going to Special Olympics, and 
you know, told her, you know, what I was doing and, uh, you know, how it benefited me. And I dropped down from, uh, you know, 250 pounds down to 195. And I was so much healthier and all. And, uh, you know, I, I just, you know, you know, I wanted to see, you know, this might be able to help, you know, her kids. So I explained to her how low impact running was. And she said, you know, this sounds like, you know, something that might benefit my kids. And the local, uh, you know, director for the Special Olympics, is Carol Goldfor, so I contacted her and she said, you know, maybe this is something that can help us. Uh, so I've got a contact over at North Shelby School, Aaron Hess, that you know, get in touch with him and show him what you got and see if it might help. So anyway, I contacted Aaron and said, why not to come over and just show you, you know, what you know, my low impact running, you know, is and see if this is something that might benefit, you know, your kids. So anyway, I set up with him. I went over one day last year and I did a seminar for uh, Aaron had about, I think it was 10 of his instructors and teachers from North Shelby School. They were there, I think, for about well, maybe 75 or 80 kids. So uh, I went ahead and you know uh, came over one afternoon and we went into the gymnasium and uh, went ahead and you know gave a little talk to the instructors and to the kids. And you know, I told them you know, pretty much you know what this was about. It was a way of uh, you know running and exercising and all. And, uh, so anyway, we, uh, you know, after, you know, I had a little talk going, we actually, you know, broke into groups out in the gymnasium, and uh, lo and behold, these kids, they loved it. They loved doing, loved impact running, they were good at it, and uh, Aaron, he was excited about it. He said, you know, this is something I think will, you know, might really work for the kids. So uh, I told him, I said, well, you know, let's go ahead and see what happens. So, uh, you know, we went ahead and, uh, you know, finished the demonstration to the kids and, uh, you know, at all. And, uh, he got some of them and said, hey, you know, this is something that, uh, you know, that is going to benefit of you want to go ahead and, uh, you know, spread this around to uh, other, you know, schools and all, and, you know, show them what, you know, you're doing, and, uh, you know, see if we can go ahead and get a program established that can, uh, you know, help these kids, uh, not only, you know, exercising, but, you know, also, you know, it's just, uh, you know, great activity, you know, for them and all. So, uh, Anyway, I, you know, I told Aaron, I said, listen, I, you know, I got a day job, and you know, I don't know if I can go around, you know, and uh, you know, meet with the different schools and all, and you know, help out the, uh, you know, the kids that uh, you know, can be helped with some you know, mentally and physically challenged kids. I know, you know, it's healthy, but I don't know if I can, I can do this or not, you know, by myself, you know, with uh, you know, a full-time job. And so I came up with an idea, you know, uh, uh, talked to a friend of mine, Scott Temple. He's, uh, uh, professor over at the uh, college and I talked to him about it. He's a videographer. So I asked him, you know, is there any way we can do a video that we can, uh, you know, go ahead and, uh, you know, have, have the kids participate in that I'll be able to show to, uh, you know, the people, uh, you know, the Special Olympics and they can give out to, you know, their different chapters and also the, uh, the schools that help the mentally and physically challenged kids, you know, that they can have this and be a way that you know, they can offer their kids, uh, uh, you know, a physical activity that they're good at and all. And uh, so, anyway, Scott said, uh, you know, he could help me with it. So, uh, I got with uh, Aaron over at the North Shelby School and, uh, uh, you know, told him, you know, what my you know, plans were, you know, with us. So, uh, Aaron Hess, he said, well, you know, let's go ahead and, you know, see what, you know, we can work out on this. So, that was sort of the start of this, uh, you know, entire idea about doing a, uh, you know, a video, and it's just a, you know, a non-profit thing that I, I just want to be able to help, you know, the uh, mentally and physically challenged kids. My first cousin is severely mentally challenged, and I've never been able to help him before, and I thought, you know, this is a way that I might be able to help. I can, you know, give these kids, uh, you know, show them a way that they can run that they're good at, and, you know, this was sort of, you know, perfect for them because low-impact running is sort of a, uh, a shuffling type, you know, motion, but, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, excellent. I, I did my first marathon using low impact running because, uh, you know, my osteoarthritis and torn meniscus, I could not conventionally, uh, you know, do conventional running. So, you know, I switched over to this. So, you know, it's something that can benefit, you know, uh, not only uh, the, uh, the uh, kids that are mentally and physically challenged, but anybody can use low impact running to help them, you know, have a you know, healthier lifestyle. So, Anyway, uh, you know, that's, uh, you know, how I got hooked up with uh, North Shelby School and uh, started working with them. 
but I know this uh, you know, video that I want to uh, you know, film over at North Shelby, I want this to be something that they can participate in and uh, uh, you know, that we can offer, you know, I can send this out to different chapters of the uh, Special Olympics and all this is, uh, you know, no cost, but it's something that uh, I made sort of a mission that I want to help, you know, the kids over there and other, you know, kids, uh, you know, across the nation and this is something that, you know, they can do and they can do well and it's really, uh, you, know, has, you know, it's really been, uh, you know, a blessing to me that it's something that, you know, I might be able to offer to them, but I just want to run this by y'all tonight and, you know, see what your, you know, thoughts were on it and if it's something that you think will, you know, benefit North Shelby and also other schools and also the Special Olympics is something that I want to pursue, you know, at no cost, this is something that my wife and I are going to do at our expense, and uh, we want to make it available, you know, to you know people across the state and hopefully people across you know, the country. And uh, so that's you know basically what it is. Okay, so what you're asking is because you're already doing the, the low impact running with them at North Shelby, is that right? Or uh, they were, so you're asking for our permission to. Uh, yes, uh, you know, I've already shown them what it is, and they, you know, participated in it, and you know, everybody there seemed to like it. Uh, Aaron Hess and uh, uh, you know uh, Carol, you know, all of them, you know, liked the idea. But you know, I just want to go ahead and present it to y'all, and you know, see if this is something that I can, uh, you know, proceed with. And uh, like I said, you know, Scott uh, Taylor, he's a videographer, and uh, I just want to, you know. You know have him you know, actually do the uh, you know the filming you know over to North Shelby and then uh, you know also uh, you know after that you know I want to do one you know for the Special Olympics incorporating uh, you know North Shelby you know into it. So you would use the video then not necessarily for the North Shelby students but you would use the video to promote low impact mining in, in other places. Yes. So I just want to make sure yeah. I understand. I want to use the North Shelby kids to uh, you know, participate in it, and Aaron Hess, uh, you know, also, and that'll be sort of like the, uh, uh, you know, just uh, you know, show and tell, you know, with, with those kids that this can also be used, you know, across the state and across the country to, you know, to help the, uh, you know, the mentally and physically challenged kids. I have a question. It might be from Mr. Shore. Uh, legally and. By permission, we need to get, or we take care of the permission slips so that the kids can be videoed. Absolutely. We'll, we'll tailor that permission specifically for this, request the permission from the parents, see how the pool is, and make sure that we do it according to all of our policies as we currently do. And how um, the principal, is she on the board with all this? Heavily involved. Matter of fact, she is the one contacted me this uh, for the project. We sat down uh, for 45 minutes to an hour or so discussing this with her, with Aaron, who was the PE teacher, by the way, for clarification, and, uh, and other folks at the school who were there. They're very excited to do this. We just kind of wanted to step back for a moment, make sure that we approach it the correct way, at least for a permission's sake, and uh, so that we, we don't run any roadblocks because it seems like something that's already accepted there. This will be done after school so that it does not take away from instructional time. And we can certainly figure that out. Yep. Sure. I don't know of any group anywhere that's more protective of their children than the folks over at Fort Shelf. And I know they're very protective of privacy and very protective of their students and the time. And, and, that's, and it's not a profit. Um, and uh, if they are buying into this, then I don't have a real problem. Those are my concerns to being not a of the fact that they bought into it. And I know that they're going to make sure that the privacy concerns of any parents are, are certainly looked at. We'll make sure they're well protect, protected in this process, but at the same time, we want to give them the, uh, those who want to participate the, the freedom to have a good time and be part of a, an awesome training video. I would, uh, I would like to just say a couple things. I, I definitely like what you do with the logic. Hello, uh, I really appreciate that. Um, you know, I, and I went over to North Shelby, and several of us were there whenever they talked about. You weren't there, but we heard a lot about 
what you do. Um, and we really appreciate how you support our students. I guess my um, question would be more along the lines of uh, what is low impact running? I, I remember you saying it was a shuffle, but um, you know, when it comes to low, I mean, what's the difference between low impact running and walk? Okay, uh, conventional running is when you're picking your legs up like this. Low impact running, you're keeping your feet low to the ground and uh, your, your hip, your movement from your hip muscles instead of raising uh, your legs up. And uh, that's why it's called you know, low impact. With high impact, you're constantly doing this. So that's what's causing you know, deterioration to your knees and that type of thing. But with the, uh, you know, the low impact, like I said, you know, just basically that's it. You're not raising your feet up and hitting the ground with a high impact and doing with you know, conventional. You did the whole marathon in the low impact. Uh, yeah, yeah, 26 miles. But it's, uh, you know, and like I said, uh, it's open up doors. Uh, uh, a friend of mine who did a uh, Boston Marathon uh, last year, and he said he was at mile, I think it was 13, and all of a sudden this guy passed him, and uh, what he was doing, he was low in the pack running. He had his feet low to the ground, and he was just, you know, doing the shuffling most of like that. And, uh, you know, he passed my buddy, and he's, uh, you know, a great runner in order to, you know, be at the Boston Marathon. But it's, uh, you know, you can take low impact running to what extremely, you know, you want to. And uh, I basically, you know, the running I do, I keep sort of a, uh, you know, a shorter stride. The ones that are going like, you know, Boston Marathon, that type of thing, they seem to increase their stride. But if you're keeping your feet low to the ground, you don't have a high impact from, uh, uh, you know, conventional running, which causes a lot of the, you know, the problems that I run into with osteoarthritis and torn meniscus and that type of thing. So it's a uh, uh, low impact running enabled me to uh, you know, keep fit and uh, you know uh, continue running and uh, but open up other doors, you know, be able to show people that you know thought they could not run again, giving them a way to uh, you know get out and you know, exercise again and uh, you know you know just sort of you know uh, you know develop and maintain a healthy lifestyle. Thank you. Nice. Thank you. Additionally, there's a nutrition component that he had mentioned, and also the Cleveland healthcare system is heavily involved, and there's a couple doctors already signed up to be part of this process. So there's there's buy-in from that industry as well. Just to add that. Yeah, we do have uh, been lucky to contact uh, you know uh, different people, and there are uh, you know, a couple uh, you know, doctors that are going to be you know, participating, you know, in video. <coughs> ideas on uh, nutrition also so a lot of people have you know really you know, given support on this uh, you know project and it's just uh, become sort of a passion of mine and uh, uh, it's something that I think will uh, you know benefit the uh, you know, kids so it's hopefully something that you know, we can actually do. Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to make a motion to give them Should I be able to, uh, you know, uh, you know, regards to, you know, like, or Shelby, a 
I show it to the principal there and let her go ahead and handle, you know, get the permission from um, any parents that, you know, that are, that have their children involved, that type of thing? Yes, I think the, the principal uh, and Mr. Shaw. Chair, members of the board, Dr. Walls, you have in your packet the contract for health services for the 1415 school year pursuant to the, uh, your policies because this contract is a, uh, above $100,000 for bringing it to you for your approval. Uh, there are several items in your packet. The first is a cover letter that uh, uh, to Dr. Walls and uh, Ms. Wyatt that uh, dictates uh, the, the increased cost that they have and why they're requesting slight increase in the uh, budget, which by the way is 3%. Uh, the next part of that is, is the letter to Dr. Hopper uh, with the instructions for the document. The next uh, document is actually the contract for the bloodborne pathogens, which is 2000. That's the training that they do for our employees. And then the final part of that, well, excuse me, the next part after that is the health contract itself. And the increase this year of fourteen thousand dollars will take it to fourteen, excuse me, to four hundred ninety-eight thousand five hundred twenty-six dollars. And then the final document is basically the, the contract responsibilities. It spells out what we expect of the health department and what the health department expects of us to uh, actually uh, administer and implement this uh, health services program within our schools. I'd be more happy to try to respond to any questions, but Dr. Hopper would probably be a better, better source for that. But we respectfully request uh, your approval of the contract so that we can move forward. Other than the increases that you mentioned, are there any changes? No. The previous year? Yes, there are not. Does anyone have any questions for Dr. Hopper on this board? I assume that if, if uh, we'll continue to be a healthy partnership. It's a good partnership. It really is. It's just not a light. It is not a light. Too late to be back. We did job for it. They do provide one of the services for our students. Is there a motion to approve the contracts with the health department? Move that we approve the contracts with the health department.
proposed. Uh, he would bring, be bringing with him uh, actually a couple of trustees uh, and some colleagues from Duke University, as well as trustee from Duke University and a trustee from Chapel Hill. This will be a series that we hope to have uh, four sessions per year for our juniors and seniors, top students in, in the class, uh, to have some uh, really career-based presentations that are really uh, a lot of STEM, those kinds of careers. But that will be here in this auditorium starting at 10, 10 o'clock. So if you want to stop by on Thursday, I think that'll be, I heard him speak about two years ago and most, one of the most intriguing presentations that I've ever heard. I was able to keep a group of superintendents um, in thrall for about two and a half hours with the work that So I hope it'll be a good uh, session for our students. But we'll also have an opportunity following that event for them to go to the Staff Development Center, have lunch, and have some conversations about the information that you present. So you're welcome to join us for that on this Thursday. Morning here in the room. Sunday, we've already informed you, will be the Kings Mountain uh, Fieldhouse dedication. You know that that's a project that has been uh, done by group raising funds in our community. That we're not, uh, that's not something that you funded, but that touchdown club there at Kings Mountain High School has funded that facility and they're ready to get, dedicate that Sunday afternoon at 3 o'clock. We'd love for each of you to attend. If you'll now let me know that you plan to attend so that I can kind of give them a number. Of, of how many board members to expect, and there will also be tours of that facility. We do have uh, our first graduation that I've not mentioned, well, excuse me, uh, before that, May 15th, is our teacher assistant banquet. I'd be remiss if I did not mention that to you. You know about that event. Same as we've had in the past years, it will be at Zor Church. It costs us $15. Um, I'm not sure the speaker, whether he'll be worth $15 or more, but <laughs> John Garman will be their guest speaker. This year, so it may be worth more than $15 this year. Uh, you get your tickets and attend that. Uh, then we have our first uh, graduation is on May 22nd. That's our Cleveland Early College High School. That graduation will be at 6.30 p.m. at the Grand Center. Then the North Shelby graduation, which is my favorite graduation of the year, is on May 30th at 10 a.m. That will be at North Shelby. And then on June 6th and 7th, we'll have our traditional graduations. And you know the schedule for those. Pursuant to General Statute 143.31a.11, subsection A6, I would entertain a motion to enter into close 